Humanity, an Introduction to Cultural Anthropology, 11th edition, chapter 7. Culture and Nature Interacting with the Environment. Anthropologists who follow the materialist orientation, chapter 5, believe human environment interactions are important causes of cultural differences and similarities. <clears throat> Materialists also argue that changes in human environment relationships are prime movers of long-term cultural changes. In this chapter, we follow the materialist orientation by describing the major ways human groups interact with the nat natural environment because besides describing interactions between humans and nature. We analyze their main cultural consequences, how they affect or shape other aspects of human life. We also discuss how long-term changes in human environment interactions led to major changes in human life. Later chapters deal with other dimensions of cultural diversity, including forms of exchange, marriage, and family life, or political organization, religion and worldview, and artistic expression. Understanding interactions. In the biological sciences, adaptation refers to how organization, organisms re survive and reproduce in their environments to emphasize that human groups to greater or lesser degrees alter their environments in the process of living in them. For humans, the term interaction is more accurate than adaptation. Of course, other animals also alter their environments, as when beavers construct dams, birds build nests, prairie dogs dig burrows, and earthworms aerate and create new soil with their casings. But to a much greater extent, humans intensively and inter intentionally modify nature as they interact with it. As when farmers clear land for crops, families cut forests for houses and fires, civilizations build cities and industrial economies produce greenhouse gases, both prehistorically and historically. Humans altered hum nature in the process of adjusting to it. Interaction both emphasizes these alterations and calls attention to how humans and nature mutually affect each other. As with other species, the environment as affects humans physio physiologically and genetically. For example, bacteria, viruses, and parasites kill or sicken susceptible individuals, but those who are genetically resistant survive reproduce and pass more of their genes along to the next generation. By means of natural selection over many generations, human populations become more resistant to, to the life-threatening microorganisms to which they are exposed. Even as microorganisms evolve better means of attacking us, natural selection acting on our genes helps us to adjust to environments where we live. The most important way humanity differs from other species is that we adjust to changes in our environments, mainly not exclusively, by means of cultural changes rather than genetic ones. If the climate grows colder or if a group migrates to colder area, humans cope primarily by lighting fires, constructing shelters, and making warm clothing, not generally by evolving psychological adaptations to cold, humans hunt animals by making weapons and mastering techniques of cooperative stalking and killing, not by phys physically evolving the ability to run faster than prey. Group corporation and technology, including both the tools and themselves and the knowledge required to make and use them, allow humans to adapt to a wide range of of environments without undergoing major alterations in their genetic makeup. The transmission of socially learned knowledge and behavior that is culture enabled humanity to colonize all of Earth, Earth's terrestrial habitats from tropical rain 
forests to Arctic tundra, from the vast grassy plains of Central Asia to tiny Pacific atolls. Our ability to live in diverse habitats by means of technology and group living is mainly responsible for the success of human species. Humanity is by far the most abundant mammal for our size. In 2016, around 7.4 billion and our numbers continue to grow. One of the many dimensions to human environment relationships, two are most important for our purposes. First, the natural environment in which people live provide resources that they extract to meet their material needs and wants. From their natural surroundings, people harness energy to nourish their bodies, food to keep themselves warm and cook their food, foods, fuel, and to put to other uses. People mine raw materials like stone and metals to make tools and cut trees to provide shelter. Harnessing energy and harvesting materials takes technology, tools and skills, and requires that people expand, expend their own time and energy in labor or work. As they use their technology and expend their labor, people transform resources into products that help meet their needs and wants. Second, the environment poses certain problems that people strive to solve to or overcome. Resource scarcity, excessively high or low temperatures, parasites and diseases, rainfall variability, deficient sto soils, and so forth. Solving these and other problems of living in a particular time and place sometimes leads to a group leads a group to modify their surroundings. For example, hunters can set fire to woodlands or grasslands to attract animals to to their territories. Farmers can produce more food by clearing new lands, fertilizing soils, and irrigating crops. Industrialized nations construct highways, shopping malls, factories, and housing developments. There are other dimensions to human nature interactions as well. Human social animals, see chapter two, who live in groups of various sizes and compositions. Groups have to organize their members to acquire resources and solve problems efficiently. First, individuals have to know what to do and what they can expect others to do. So groups allocate different tasks to different people, resulting in the division of labor. Second, many tasks are more efficient if people work together for common goals. For example, several hunters may have a better chance of spotting, tracking, and killing large game than a single hunter because corporate cooperation is often more efficient and enjoyable than working alone. Human groups develop patterns of co cooperation. Third, it is helpful for if people know when and where to apply technology and labor so they do not com conflict with others or get in another one another's way. Groups, therefore, develop patterned ways of allocating resources among individuals, families, and other kinds of social units. Materialist anthropologists prioritize human environmental interactions in their efforts to explain cultural differences and to account for long-term cultural changes in our species. Humanistic anthropologists tend to disagree that material factors should be given this priority. For reasons described in Chapter 5, even if materialists are correct, always keep in mind that how a people interact with na nature affects some aspects of their life more than others' aspects. <clears throat> Excuse me, at the broadest level, Anthropologists place human environment relationships into four major categories based largely on how people acquire products, especially food, to meet their material needs and wants. One, hunting gathering, also called foraging, in which people exploit the wild plants and animal of the territory for food. Agriculture or cultivation, in which people intentionally plant, care for, and harvest crops. Domesticated plants, for food and other uses, herding or pastoralism, in which people tend to tend, breed, and harvest products of livestock, domesticated animals for food, trade, and other uses. Industrialism, in which people discovered ways of harnessing the energy in fossil fuels 
coal, oil, natural gas, resulting in a dramatic increase in levels of material consumption and profits for private industries. The first three categories are pre-industrial, applying to how all of humanity acquired food before the Industrial Revolution of the late 1700s, even after their origins and spread the spread of industrialism. Many of the world's people remained pre-industrial. Pre-industrial thus refers to cultural condition rather than to a period of time. In a few places, pre-industrial societies still survive, which does not mean they are unaffected by industrialized portion of humanity. This listing does not faithfully depict the com complex realities of human environment interactions. It is very important to recognize that the categories are not mutually exclusive. For example, until contact with the Europeans after 19 1492, many Native American cultures cultivated crops like corn, beans, squat, and squash yet relied on wild game and or fish for most of their fleshy food because most people kept no livestock. Many African people today farm some of their lands, but they also raise cattle and other livestock on lands less suitable for agriculture. Since agriculture began several thousand years ago, most peoples have adopted a combination of product production strategies depending on their technology technologies, local environments, and what their neighbors are doing. Finally, in industrialized nations, various occupations engage in hunting, fishing, agriculture, and livestock husbandry. However, nearly all citizens pursue these activities for wages and profits rather than their own substances. Let me go ahead and cue in on this so that you can write down the vocabulary words. Oops, sorry, I'm shaky today. Hunting and gathering. Hunter gatherers, also called foragers, acquire food from collecting, gathering the wild plants and hunting and or fishing the animals that live in their regions. On current evidence, Homo sapiens has existed as a separate species for around 100,000 years. But no people farmed crops or herded livestock until, ten, until about 10,000 years ago. And most peoples continued to live off wild plants and animals until a few thousand years ago. Hunting and gathering thus supported humanity for nearly 90% of our existence as a unique species. Figure 7.1 sh shows where hunter-gatherers lived at the time of their first contact with Europeans even after Western colonization. Colonialism, sorry, incorporated so, so many indigenous people into larger systems. Many hunter-gatherers survived in a few places even into the 20th century. Here's a picture of the map and then I'll go on to the... Although foragers do not grow crops or keep livestock for meat and other products, many attempt to increase their food supply in other ways. For example, some Native Americans periodically burned forests and grasslands to attract game or increase the supply of sun-loving wild berries or other plants. However, compared to farmers and herders, hunters and gatherers do not modify their natural environments very much, but instead take what nature offers. If edible wild plants are available only in particular places during particular seasons, foragers move to those places at those times to harvest them. If important game animals live in large migra migratory herds, hunters must follow them or else hunt other animals when the herds have left their region. A brief general principle helps understand the foraging way of life. To acquire re resources efficiently, foragers must organize themselves to be in the right place at the right time with the right numbers of people. Foraging and culture. Anthropologists have classified hunting and gathering as a single type of adaptation and in the minds of many people, for all foragers seem pretty much alike. 
This is why you may have heard when humans were still hunters and gatherers um, of the African savanna, but foragers living in different habitats differ, partly because environments vary in the kinds of and quality of food resources they contain. For example, fishing peoples of the resource-rich environment of the American Northwest Coast lived a fairly sedentary existence in large permanent settlements, whereas the Shoshone of the arid and resource-sparse American Great Basin roamed in small bands or individual families. Despite such differences, most, but not all, foraging peoples share certain culture, cultural similarities. Our main goal in this section is to describe how hunter-gatherer interaction with the environment affects their cultures. Division of labor by gender and sex. Among foraging peoples, gender and age are the major basis for the division of labor. Of course, in any group, special knowledge and skill also are a basis for assigning tasks. In the vast majority of foraging peoples, men do almost all hunting and women most of the gatherings of plants. However, it is not unusual for either gender to lend a hand with the activities of the other. For example, among the Bambadati of the tropical forest of Central Africa, the women and children help the men with hunting and by driving game animals into nets. However, in general, hunting is men's work. Since, excuse me, seasonal mobility, most foragers move frequently to cope with seasonal changes. None of the Earth's environments offers the same kinds of quantities of resources year-round. Most places experience seasonal differences in precipitation outside the humid tropics. Marked seasonal variations in temperature occur as well. Ordinarily, game animals are only available in some places at different seasons. And most nuts and fruits are available only at only certain times of the year. Foragers migrate to where food or water is most plentiful or easiest to acquire during a given season. For example, the Hadzabi people of Tanzania live in an arid region with distinct wet and dry seasons. In the rainy months, the Hadzabi disperse around the many temporary water holes that form living on the wild plan plants and animals in the immediate vicinity. At another time of the year, when these ponds evaporate, they live in large camps clustered around the few re relatively permanent water sources. Seasonal Congregation and Dispersal To gather plants and hunt animals efficiently, foragers adjust the sizes of their living groups to adapt to the seasonal availability and abundance of their food supply. At some times of the year, it is most efficient to disperse into small groups which co cooperate in the search for food. During other seasons, these groups come to together in large, larger congregations. The Western Shoshone live in the arid Great Basin in parts of the states we now call Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming, until white settlers disrupted their indigenous way of life. In the mid-19th century, the Shoshone lived off of wild plants and animals, most of their meat came from deer, antelope, and small mammals, such as rabbits and squirrels. Plant foods included roots and seasonally available seeds, berries, pine nuts, and other wild products. For most of the year, Shoshone roamed the dry valleys and slopes of the Great Basin in tiny groups consisting of a few families or even single families. Families occasionally gathered for cooperative hunting of antelopes and rabbits, which they drove into corals and nets. But a more permanent aggregation of families were difficult because a local area did not have enough resources to support large numbers of people for more than a few days. Around October, the cones of the pinyon trees on the high mountains ripened and produced large nourishing pine nuts. During their travels in the late summer, 
Shoshone families noticed which specific mountain areas had the most promising pine nut harvest. They arranged their movements to arrive at these productive area areas in early fall. 10 to 20 families arrived in the same region harvesting their and storing pine nuts, which sometimes lasted throughout most of the winter. In spring, the family split up again, reliving the pattern of dispersal into small groups until the next fall. Bands. To hunt and gather efficiently, in most environments, foragers live in small mobile groups of 50 or fewer. To distinguish these living groups <clears throat> from the settled hamlets, villages, towns, and cities, found among other peoples, anthropologists call these mobile living groups bands. Chapter 12 discusses the political aspects of band life. All or most members of a single band are relatives or are married into the band. Can folk or not members cooperate in acquiring the wild resources of a given territory? In most foraging communities, the size of bands is flexible with the numbers adjusted to the availability of food supply. The Ju Huansi, also known as the Kong of South, Southern Africa, illustrate band organization living in what is now South, what, Southeast Angola, Northeast Namibia, I can't pronounce that. And northwestern Botswana. The Jew Huansi are the most thoroughly studied of all hunter gatherers. The northern part of their southern of their environment is an arid tropical savanna, which turns into the Kalahari Desert in the south into the twentieth century. Most Jew Huansi exploited this habitat entirely by foraging. They gathered more than 100 species of plants and hunted over 50 kinds of animals, including mammals, birds, and reptiles. Plant foods consisted of nuts, fruits, berries, melons, roots, and greenery. A particularly important and nourishing food was the mongongo nut, which ripens in April and provided about half of the people's cal caloric intake. Because their habitat received so little rainfall, and then only seasonally, the availability of water greatly affected the seasonal rhythm of the Juhansi from about April to October, winter in the Southern Hemisphere. There was little precipitation. Practically no rain fell between June and September during this dry season. Water for people and animals was available only at a few permanent water holes around which many families congregated into relatively large settlements of 50 or more individuals. When summer rainstorms created temp temporary water holes between November and March, Juhansi traveled in smaller camps to exploit the more widely distributed wild resources. But rainfall in this part of Southern Africa is not reliable from year to year or place to place. In some years, up to 40 inches of rain falls during the wet months. In other years, as little as six inches. Precipitation is also spatially unpredictable. One local area may receive several thunderstorms while 20 miles away, there is no rain at all. Aridity, seasonality, and variability in precipitation influence how the Juhansi organize their hands during wet months. People spread out among the temporary water holes in camps with about 10 to 30 persons. When they moved to a water hole that had not been occupied recently, game was relatively plentiful and a wide variety of plant foods were easily available. But the longer a band remained, the more its members exhausted the resources surrounding the water hole. The men had to roam farther away from their camps in their hunts, and the women had to travel longer distances while collecting plants. After several weeks, the people at the camp would judge the cost of continuing to forage in the area were not bringing adequate returns in food. They then moved to a new wet season camp. One ethno ethnographer 
Richard Lee <clears throat> succinctly noted that the Juhansi typically occupy a camp for a period of weeks or months and eat their way out of it, 1969, page 60. If the Juhansi stayed in larger groups during the dry months, they would have had to move more often, consuming more time and energy. As the months passed and the land dried up, people made their way back to the permanent water holes where several dozen people congregated, and the lower quantity of and variety of food made life a bit harder. <laughs> reciprocal sharing. Recipro yeah, reciprocal sharing. Sorry about that. It is mutually beneficial for foragers to share food and other possessions, both within and between families. The sharing is more or less on the basis of need. Those who have more than they can immediately use share with others. For example, among the Juhansi, on any given day, only some people actually go out gathering and hunting. Sharing apples, especially to meet successful hunters, returning to camp, share the kill with other families, including those who have not participated on the, in the day's hunt. One reason for this special emphasis on the sharing of meat is the uncertain returns of hunting compared to gathering. Among the Juhansi, on most days, women return to camp with their, carry, with their carrying bags full of nuts, roots, fruits, and other wild plants. Men's choices, chances of capturing game, however, are smaller, only about two out of three, two out of five hunting trips capture animals large enough to take back to camp. Men who are successful one day may be unsuccessful the next. So they give today an exception of receiving tomorrow or later. Sharing or is norm normatively expected behavior. People who regularly fail to share are subjected to ridicule of or other kinds of social pressures. Going along with the expectation of sharing is a positive cultural value placed on equality of personal possession, possessions, property, and even of social status. Families who attempt to hoard food or other products may, may be ostracized. Men who try to place themselves about, above others socially by boasting about their hunting skills or other accomplishments are soon put in their place. The result is that, compared to many other peoples, there is both economic and social equality between the families of most hunting and gathering bands. Resource Allocation it is useful to have familiar patterned ways of allocating natural resources among individual families and other kinds of groups. Property rights in some form, many hunters and gatherers have developed similar ways of allocating such rights. Who can harvest which resources, where and when? One possible way to allocate rights over a territory and its resources is for each group to establish and maintain exclusive claims to particular territories. Cultural ideas about the relationship between people and territory might be, for example, that this area is mine or ours, whereas that area is yours or theirs. Among foragers, exclusive access would be would mean that each band has rights to remain in a specific area during a particular season. One benefit of allocating rights in this way is that the members of each band would know they alone can harvest the foods found in particular places at definite times. Another advantage is that bands would not interfere in one another's hunting and gathering activities. Despite the apparent benefits, most foragers allocate rights to resources differently. Among the Shoshone, during the hot months, when nuclear or extended families were sparsely distributed, rights to resources were, quote, first come, first served, unquote, meaning that whichever group arrived at an area first was free to harvest its plants and animals. No family had exclusive access to any particular territory in any season. 
Among the Juhansi rites were a little better defined people recognized particular individuals as the owners, unquote, places where food and water resources were found commonly the reliable water holes together with wild resources around them were, quote, owned, unquote, by a set of siblings whose rights grew stronger as they grew older. But by merely asking permission, seldom refused anyone with a kinship relationship to one of the owners could come visit and use the area's food and water. But most Johansi had many relatives and in-laws who were, quote, owners of various places. Each family had many options about where and with whom they would live, work, relax, and socialize. Thus, who was living and foraging together fluctuated radically, and each band received visitors several times a year. Instead of establishing exclusive claims to particular places, Johansi families were attached loosely to territories for most for the most part, they came and went according to their preferences and circumstances. If a quarrel or, or dispute occurred, one of the parties could simply leave to join another group temporarily. Most other known hunter-gatherers had similar ways of allocating rights to resources. To sum up, most forest, foraging peoples were similar in the following aspects. Division of labor based mainly on gender and age, frequently movement based on seasonal changes, congregation and dispersal of groups, especially from season to season, living in small bands of varying size and flexible composition, strong values of reciprocal sharing and of equality in personal possessions and social status, loose attachment of people to territory and flexible rights to resources. You can see how these similarities helped foragers harsh harness resources and cope with problems. But although these characteristics described most hunter-gatherers reasonably well, we must keep in mind that foragers are diverse. Not all have these cultural features. In fact, in some environments, foragers lived quite differently along the northwest coast of North America, Roughly from the northernmost California into the Alaskan panhandle, food resources, especially fish, were exceptionally abundant, abundant, and the Native Americans who lived there were able to smoke and preserve a supply of fish that lasted for many months. Also, salmon and other fish were more reliably abundant along the coastline than in most other environments where foragers lived in most years. People could count on fish swimming up the rivers to breed in the fall and in the bays and estuaries year round. Because of the abundance, reliability, and long term food storage, there was not much need for seasonal mobility or small living groups. Most Northwest Coast people settled into villages where many families lived in spacious and often elaborately decorated wood planked houses. Resource abundance and reliability also affected property notions along the coast. If a food source is so abundant and reliable that you can usually count on its availability, then it makes sense for you to stay close to it and defend it against other groups that might desire it as well. So people of the Northwest Coast developed, a, developed more defined property rights. Particular groups along the coastline were more closely associated with particular locations than were some people such as the Hadzabi, Shoshone, or Juhansi. Foraging cultures also varied in the northern North American Great Plains after about 1700. When the Native Americans acquired horses, Plains peoples were hunting and gatherers. They did not farm, but the horses introduced by Europeans allowed them to effectively hunt the tens of millions of bison that once grazed North America's tall grass prairies. Although they hunted antelope and other mammals, bison was Plains people's main food source resource. During the spring and summer, the bison gathered in huge herds that were most effectively hunted cooperatively by dozens of mounted men. 
In most areas of the plains, grasses grew luxuri luxuriantly in the spring and early summer, leading the bison to congregate in herds of tens of thousands. As the summer progressed, the land became drier and the grass patchier, so the bison broke up into smaller herds for the fall and succeeding winter months. The people most Americans know as the Cheyenne followed this pattern after acquiring the horse in the 1700s. What happened to hunter -ga and gatherers? <clears throat> For tens of thousands of years, living in, from wild foods worked well enough in, to allow the human population to grow to several million. Furthermore, foraging is a flexible strategy to acquire food that historically has supported people in rainforests, grasslands, savannas, high mountains, and nor northern tundra. For example, the Netsalik are an Inuit, formerly called Eskimo, unquote, people who traditionally spent the winters in igloos erected on the surface of Arctic ice on the Hudson Bay's region. Here in the winter camps, Netslik lived largely on the meat and blubber of seals that they captured by indigenous methods. As the seasons changed, the Netslik moved to rivers and lived off fish and in summer and in fall off migra migratory herds of caribou. Many people of the South American Amazon also live by hunting and gathering, hunting forest animals in the treetops as well as on the ground, ingenuity and rapid communication by social learning allowed hunter gatherers to migrate into all of the continents except Antarctica. By around 13,000 years ago, even by that early date, humanity was a successful species. There's the picture. In fact, most research suggests that hunter-gatherers enjoyed relatively high quality of life. Richard Lee's quantitative studies of the Juahuans in the 1960s show that they worked only about two and a half days per week to acquire their food supply, even adding in time spent in other kinds of work, such as tool making and housework. The Juhansi worked only about 42 hours per week. Most adults in modern industrial nations would be happy with a such total work week. Furthermore, the Juhansi's relatively modest work efforts were sufficient to keep them well-fed most of the time. Adults consumed an average of 2,355 calories and 96 grams of protein per day, more than sufficient for, the bo for their bodily needs. Robert Kelly compared figures on other foragers living in various environments. He found that working hours similar to those of the Juhansi were common in reasonably productive environments, but quantitative studies are few and have uncertain reliability. Most evidence also indicates that foraging peoples enjoyed a diverse diet and were healthy compared to farmers. Hunters and gatherers lived, live on plants and animals that naturally occur in their habitats and their cultural heritage taught how to cope with periodic droughts and other hazard, hazards. In most places, their diets were diverse compared to those far, of farmers and herders who focused their attention and efforts on only a few crops and livestock. Foraging bands were small and moved often, which reduced the incidence and spread of infectious diseases. There are, of course, exceptions, but generally hunter-gatherers did not have a hard life. If adequate nutrition and low workloads are the, the standard, once plant and animal domestication developed, however, agricultural and herding peoples increased in the numbers and expanded their territories. Over several millennia, of expansion, cultivators and herders pushed most foraging peoples into regions that were ill-suited to crops and livestock. As a result, when Europeans contact with people of other continents intensified after about 1,500 hunters and gatherers 
lived primarily in regions too cold or arid to support agriculture. See figure 7.1. In the last two or three centuries, even more foragers have lost their lands as they died from diseases and warfare, yielded their territories to outsiders <clears throat> for plantations and mines, relocated <clears throat> excuse me, onto reservations, and or gave up foraging voluntarily for other ways of making a living. By the beginning of the 20th century, most foragers had died out altogether or had become assimilated into some other society. Contact was especially hard on Native Americans who lived on lands highly coveted by Spanish, French, English, and Portuguese settlers. Because of their isolation from old world populations, Native Americans were suspected susceptible to a host of diseases brought by Europeans and the Africans they enslaved. Most scholars who have looked seriously at the impact of the disease of diseases on Native Americans estimate that 80 to 90 percent of Indians died from epidemics. Europeans did indeed conquer and subdue many Native peoples, but not in the way most imagine. Bacteria and viruses were more important than guns and bullets. The indigenous foraging peoples of Australia and Tasmania suffered in similar ways to, and to similar degrees. Only a few foragers preserved their way of life into the 20th century. In the 21st century, the hunting and gathering way of life is almost gone. The Juhansi have been surrounded by herders and many have taken up raising livestock. Governments have curtailed their old freedom of movement by fencing off lands. Some have left the Kalahari to work for wages in mines or in the 1960s and 1970s to serve as trackers for the military in South Africa. Some have voluntarily settled down at government funded stations where they have begun eating large quantities of corn porridge, drinking alcohol and catching new diseases, including HIV. Recently, governments have realized they could earn money from tourists by turning much of the Juhansi territory into game parks. Even the people themselves have become tourist attractions. Outsiders come to watch them perform traditional dances <clears throat> and curing ceremonies. The Hadzabi, discussed earlier, are one of the few remaining East African people who still get a lot of their food from foraging. 2006, the royal family of the United Arab Emirates offered large payments to the government of Tanzania to lease part of the Hadzabi land for hunting safaris. The international press publicized the lease offering, and international pressure led to the UAE to cancel the plan. But the Hadzabi had already lost some of their hunting grounds to another game park and to encroachments by neighboring peoples. In 2011, the, neighbor, the government of Tanzania recognized the legal rights of the remaining 1,500 Hadzabi to remain on their lands. However, as long as national governments can grant rights, such rights can be revoked. Just as foragers lost numbers and territories in the past, so today <clears throat> forces rising from the global economy endanger their ways of living. Some indigenous peoples of the Americas continue to hunt and gather. The Ojibwas in Minnesota harvest wild rice in lakes. Inuits hunt sea ant mammals in Alaska and the Canadian Arctic. Northwest Coast peoples still fish for salmon and other fish along the coast in, in rivers. Some Native Americans of the Great Plains and Southwest still hunt bison for ceremonial purposes. However, none of these natives make their living off their land. Too much of their land and resources have been lost. Incorporation into nations has led them to make new adaptions to cope with new problems brought, by, brought about by contacts with wealthier and more powerful people. By force and or choice, most Native Americans now live off of new resources such as jobs and market sales. The total environment in which they live is more important is more a product of their historical interactions with other peoples than of the natural world. Here is the vocabulary word for the next section.
<clears throat> Domestication of plants and animals. Domestication is <clears throat> the purposeful planting, cultivation, and harvest of selected plants and taming the taming of breeding of certain species of animals. People live by domestication of plants. Farmers increase increase the supply of their foods by replacement of the natural vegetation with edible or useful crops. Those who make part of their living from livestock herders, although most farmers also keep livestock, control their location, breeding in numbers, controlling part of the environment for farming requires new technologies and in most circumstances, additional labor inputs compared to foraging with respect to plants, in this book, we are concerned with food crops or those species that people intentionally select, plant, care for, harvest, and propagate for purposes of eating. People also grow plants for other purposes, such as for fibers, cotton, flax, hemp, or for drugs, tobacco, cocoa leaf, opium, poppy. With animals, we are concerned with livestock or those species that people raise, control, and breed to provide food, meat, dairy products, or other useful products, hides, wool, or for performing work, pulling plows, sorry, and, oh my goodness, and wagons carrying people and possessions. People also keep animals for other resources, such as companionship, pets, Origins of domestication, whereas, and winds. The whereas and winds of domestication are fa fairly well established by archaeologists, botanists, and other scholars. Most people alive today do not know that scholars, botanists, and other scholars, most people alive today do not know that many or most of their meals contain foods that were domesticated in other continents. I'm so sorry. <laughs> a Canadian meal consisting of potatoes, squash, and beef contains foods that originated from three continents. Spicy dishes in Sichuan originated in um, Sichuan province of China might contain tofu, green beans, chili peppers, sweet potato, and noodles made from wheat. Only one of these were, was domesticated in China. Knowing the original places where the, the food on our plant, plates was domesticated perhaps will help us appreciate the contributions of our long dead ancestors to how we live. Domestication of both plants and animals occurred independently in the old world, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and the new world, the Americas and the Caribbean. Before Columbus's voyages initiated contact between the two worlds, the crops grown in the two hemispheres were completely different. Old world crops. The earliest plant domestication occurred, occurred about 10,000 years ago in the region around what is now Jordan, Israel, Syria, Syria, Eastern Turkey, Western Iran, and Iraq. The region is known as the prehistorians as the fertile crescent. Wheat, barley, lentils, peas, carrots, figs, almonds, pistachios, dates, and grapes were first grown here. Oats, cabbages, lettuce, and olives were first domesticated along the Mediterranean fringe. West African people domesticated sorghum, finger millet, watermelons, and African rice between 6,000 and 4,000 years ago. Sorghum and finger millet still feed millions of people on this, on the African continent. Eggplants, cucumbers, bananas, and coconuts originated in Southern Asia and Southeast Asia. Soybeans, oriental rice, two varieties of millet, citrus fruits, fruits, and tea were domesticated in ancient China at various times. Rice around 7,000 years ago and millets as early as 10,000 years ago. Taro and Pacific yams, root crops widely grown in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and the bananas were probably the first cultivated in New Guinea or the islands around it perhaps as near early as 9,000 years ago. 
Sugarcane may have originated in the same area. We get our morning coffee from, or get our morning caffeine from coffee, first domesticated in the Ethiopian highlands. New world crops. Maize, corn, tomatoes, several varieties of beans, peppers, avocados, and cacao, now used in making of chocolate, originated in Central America and Mexico, in either the highlands or the coastal lowlands, or both. Various members of the squash family, squash, pumpkins, and gourds were first intentionally grown in the same region. Although squash probably was also grown in eastern Europe, North America, the earliest evidence for domestication of, this, of these crops is between 10,000 for maize and squash and 4,000 for common beans. Years ago, from northern and west, western South America came numerous crops that are still important to the region and of the world, including potatoes, sweet potatoes, and lima beans, dating from about 6,000 years, between 8,000 and 6,000 years ago. Lowland South American peoples were planting maniac cassava plants and pineapple. Chili peppers originated in South America also, but Europeans took them back to the Old World and then to Asia during the colonial era. Chili, chili peppers then began to spice up in southern China, India, Thailand, and other parts of the world. In the 1980s, researchers discovered the, the Native Americans who inhabited the eastern United States 5,000 to 4,000 years ago domesticated several crops, including sunflower, gourds, and squash, marsh elder, and goose foot. The indigenous peoples apparently abandoned the last two grown for their tiny seeds when maize and beans from Mesoamerica became available. With their larger seeds and better yields, a couple of crops that were important in the diet of others Indians at the time of, the, of contact with the Spanish were amar amaranth and quinoa, but the Spanish outlawed them because of their use in pagan ceremonies. They were becoming more popular in recent years some plants were domesticated not just once, but several times in various parts of the world. Squash may have independent origins in Mesoamerica, the Andes, and eastern North America. Separate species of rice were domesticated in Africa and Asia. Apparently independently, cotton was domesticated independently, independently in, in three places, South America, Central America, and either India or Africa. Three yam species were grown in West Africa, Southeast Asia, and tropical South America. Apparently, when conditions were right, peoples of all world regions were quite capable of transporting, transforming wild plants into domesticated crops. A good point to keep in mind when next you hear someone claim that cultures, usually their own, are more inventive or creative than others. I'm sorry. Or others. <laughs> than others. Old world livestock. Oh, here's the picture. Old world livestock. In the old world, the earliest animals were domesticated at about the same time and in the same places as their first crops. Dogs probably were the earliest domesticated animals. Genetic studies comparing dogs with gray wolves, their wild ancestors, suggest that people first domesticated dogs about 20,000 years ago, probably in the Middle East and or in Asia, East Asia. In the Middle East, the wild ancestors of the most important livestock lived in large herds, including sheep, goats, and cattle. These animals were and are kept for their hides, wool, meat, and milk. Another large mammal, the horse, was dom first domesticated and ridden on the Asian grasslands around 3,500 years ago. New World Livestock Compared to an ancient Old World peoples, Native Americans domesticated few livestock in the Andes. In the Andes. Llamas and alpacas <clears throat> related to camels were used for meat and transportation. Ancient Andean people also wove and dyed the thick, long hair of these animals into beautiful clothing. In South America, people still raise guinea pigs for their meat. 
Elsewhere in the Americas, turkeys and Muscovy duck, ducks were the only animals domesticated for food, and these only in f a few areas. Dogs present also in the Old World were used in hunting and often as food. Why did American Indians domesticate so few animals compared to Middle Easterners and Asians? The answer is uncertain, but one important reason may be that so many of the large herd animal species in the Americas became extinct shortly after the end of the Pleistocene epoch, about 11,000 years ago. Members of the horse and camel family, in particular, all disappeared except in the Andes. Horses did not return to the Americas until the Spanish brought them in the 1500s. Jared Diamond argues that the large herd mammals such as bison and caribou that remained after the New World extinctions were not amiable to human control. Certainly, it was not the, the cap capabilities of the intelligent of the prehistoric Indians that explains why they domesticated so few animals. What's for dinner? Soon after Spain, Portugal, France, Britain, and the Netherlands began exploring and establishing colonies on other continents. Crops and livestock spread from continent to continent during the centuries of this Columbian exchange. See chapter 4. Many New World crops were taken to various parts of the Old World, where they became important foods for millions of people. Manioc or cassava from the Amazonia became a staple in tropical Africa and Asia. Mexican corn spread widely, especially in Africa, Mediterranean, Europe, and Eastern Asia. In China, corn and South American sweet potatoes grew well in lands and climates that were marginal for other crops and probably alleviated for, or even prevented some famines. After initial resistance to the Indian potato became a staple food in Russia, Northern Europe, and especially Ireland, imagine modern Italian foods without the Mexican tomato. Over the centuries, Native American cultivators had become mass master farmers and food crops or are one of the greatest gifts they bestowed upon the rest of the world. Crops and livestock also moved across Atlantic Ocean in other direction. European colonists took Old World wheat, oats, barley, grapes, and other crops to temperate zones of the Americas and parts of the Americas with more tropical climates. Rice, bananas, and coconuts became important foods. Livestock was one of the main resources taken from the old world to the new. Pigs, cattle, sheep, and horses were introduced very soon. After European encounter with the Americas over the next couple of centuries, they multiplied rapidly and spread widely, becoming feral in many places. Excuse me. Pigs and cattle's Cattle thrived and multiplied in the Americas and became enormously abundant by the time <clears throat> European settlers began spreading over the landscape. Abundant and familiar cattle, pigs, and sheep helped attract European colonists to the Americas in the 1700s and 1800s. Plows pulled by horses, mules, and oxen turned over heavy soils and broke up matted roots of grasses, enabling settlers to farm the rich earth of the American Midwest and Plains for the first time in making this region the breadbasket for the rest of the, of the country. Few of us alive today recognize our debt to prehistoric Middle Easterners, Asians, Africans, Indians, and Mexicans who domesticated the plants and animals we eat daily. Yet most of North American meals include foods brought to the New World centuries ago from other continents in the stereotypical all-American meal of steak, potatoes with sour cream or butter, broccoli and spinach or salad, lettuce salad. Only the potatoes are truly American and they come from well south of the border.
If you live in southwestern China or southern India, your cuisine would be much different without the chili peppers and sweet potatoes that originated in South America. Today, there is an ecological movement to eat local because a lot of energy can be saved from transporting transportation costs of people in New York eat, say, apples in their own state rather than those grown in Washington. But in eating local, remember that many foods now locally grown originally came from other parts of our planet. The next time you enjoy bread and beef, think of the Middle East as you bite into the corn cob or relish the tomato in the salad. Remember the ancient Mexicans. Advantages of and costs of cultivation. Most prehistoric hunters and gatherers lived fairly well, so why humans took up farming does not have a self-evident answer. In trying to account for why agriculture developed at all, many archaeologists point to two factors that led to prehistoric foragers to begin cultivating crops. The first is climate change. In the middle, in the eastern Mediterranean, where agricultural developed earliest about 10,000 years ago, when the last ice age ended, the climate became warmer at about the same time people began domesticating plants and animals. The second factor is growing human populations. Although prehistoric hunter-gatherers lived well, once their numbers began to increase substantially, wild plants and animals could no longer support the population size in region. Growing crops gives a group greater control over the numbers of edible plants <clears throat> that exist in their environment, raising their ability of land to support people. If a field is planted in wheat or rice or corn, then nearly all of the plants growing their produce foods produce foods that human can digest. If the fields is left in its nat natural state, only a fraction of the wild plants are digestible and hence edible. Thus, agriculture nearly always supports far more people per unit of territory. How these two factors interacted and the importance of other factors is one of the most controversial issues. I'm sorry. One of the most controversial issues in modern archaeology. However, most agree the single greatest and most widespread advantage of agriculture over foraging is that agriculture supports far more people, 10 or even 100 times more than gathering and hunting. Farming the land does entail costs. However, creating and maintaining the community of plants that make up a garden or farm require labor, time, and energy. First, the plot must be prepared for planting by removing at least some of the natural vegetation, whether it be forest or grasses. In some kinds of agriculture, people modify the landscape itself by constructing furrows, dikes, ditches, terraces, or other artificial landforms. Second, the crops must be planted, requiring an investment of labor that foragers do not make. Third, natural pro processes continually invade the artificial plant community and landscapes, landscape that people have created. Weeds invade to compete and compete for light and soil nutrients. Animal pests are attracted to the densely growing crops and floods may wash away physical improvements. Periodically, cultivators must beat back nature by removing weeds, protecting against pests, rebuilding earthworks, and so forth. Fourth, the act of farming itself reduces the suitability, suitably of a site for future harvest by reducing soil fertility, if nothing else. In future years, the farmers must somehow restore their plots to a usable condition or their yields will fail. Well, fall. All these necessities require labor and other kinds of energy expenditures. Once plants and animals were domesticated over the next several thousand years, many foraging peoples took up cultivating crops and raising livestock, even though they did not develop farming themselves. Most people who lived in European, African, and Asian environments that could support reliable farming 
became farmers by 4,000 or 3,000 years ago. However, this probably did not occur primarily because hunter and hunters and gatherers witnessed the benefits of farming, and so they adopted crops and took the opportunity to work less and be better nourished. One reason for the spread of agriculture was become because farming people lived in denser settlements and outnumbered foragers. So they tended to spread into regions suitable for cultivation, displacing or depopulating the hunter-gatherers who had l been living there. In parts of the old world, having livestock was efficient complement to farming. Having these animals meant that most men eventually grew up hunting, putting their labor into farming, crafts, warfare, metallurgy, ruling, and other activities instead. When mounted, Horses greatly increased the speed of long-distance travel and, of course, increased the mobility of warriors and soldiers. Horses, donkeys, South Asian yaks, and camels enabled people to carry heavy loads long distances, increasing the possibilities and benefits of trade, especially when the animals pulled wagons and carts. For thousands of years, camels made it possible for people and products to cross vast stretches of arid lands in Central Asia and North Africa's Sahara. When harnessed to plows, cattle, horses, mules, and Asian water buffalo supplemented human labor and farming. Their dung added nutrients to agricultural fields and gardens. Finally, pigs first brought under human control in Southwest Asia and perhaps Eastern Asia are now a standing source of protein and today remain the major source of meat in China and non-Muslim Southeast Asia. In the New World, except for residents of the Andes, farming peoples continued to acquire all or most of their meat from deer, antelope, small, anim small mammals, fish, and other wild animals. Most New World peoples got the bulk of their meat from wild, not domesticated animals, even though many of them were farmers. Plant and animal domestication probably had more long-lasting and dramatic effects on cultures than any other single set of changes in people's relationship with nature, except industrialization. For example, once certain plants evolved by human selection into crops, people produced more food in a given area of land. Increased production allowed them to retain, to remain in one place for long periods. Over time, groups became more sedentary. They could also live in much larger settlements than the bands of most foragers. Groups settled in villages and later in some places in towns and cities. Pre-industrial farming systems are conveniently divided into two overall forms, based partly on the energy source used in farming and on how often a garden or field is cultivated. The forms are usually called horticultural and intensive agriculture. Both have many, many, many varieties, far too many for us to even mention most of them. Horticulture. I'll go ahead and zoom in on the vocabulary word. In horticulture, people use ma mainly or entirely the energy power of their own muscles to clear land, turn the, oil, turn the soil, plant, weed, and harvest crops. There are no plows pulled by horses, oxen, or other draft animals to help prepare the soil. Instead, hand tools such as Digging sticks, shovels, and hoes are used for most tasks. Some people clear new fields by burning the natural vegetation and fertilize their gardens with animal or human waste or with other kinds of organic matter. If irrigation is necessary, horticulturalists usually hand carry water from nearby rivers or streams, figure 7.2 shows the most important regions where horticultural adaptations existed at the same at the time of contact by the west here's the picture varieties of horticulture one type of sorry one type of horticulture is shifting cultivation also called slash and burn <coughs> excuse me 
once widespread in the modern era, it occurs in small pockets of tropical rainforests in Central and South America, Southeast Asia, and Central Africa, shifting cultivators for farm the forest in a cycle using axes, knives, and other hand tools. They first cut down a small area of forest after the wood and leaves dry out. They burn them to recycle some valuable plant nutrients in the form of ash. Generally, a given garden plot is cultivated for only two or three years before its, fertility, its fertility declines, and it's gradually abandoned. Then a new area of the forest is cleared and burned, and a new garden is planted, tended, and harvested. After a few years, its yields also fall. That plot, too, is left for the forest to regrow until the land can regain produce and adequate harvest, <clears throat> which typically takes 10 or more years. Shifting cultivation works well as Long as population density, the number of people who live in an area of given size, does not grow too large. For every plot of land under cultivation at any time, several plots are, are fallowed. They have been left alone for the forest to regrow and the land to recover. If for every acre of land being cultivated, 10 acres are under fallow, then far fewer people can could be supported per acre than if only half the land were followed at any any one time. Environmentalists often blame shifting cultivators for cutting and burning the tropical forests that are carbon sinks and that protect the land from sun erosion. To some extent, this is true. However, shifting cultivation has been practiced for many centuries, whereas large-scale deforestation is a more recent phenomenon. Perhaps the blame for deforestation lies elsewhere. Dry land gardening is another form of horticulture. Is, uh, it is defined by the main care climatic factor with which cultivators have to cope low, erratic, and unpredictable rainfall. Dry land gardening occurs in the American Southwest, in arid parts of Mexico, in some of the Middle East, and in some much in much of the sub-Saharan Africa, in the arid regions of Africa, <clears throat> where rainfall is too low and unpredictable to depend entirely on crops. People complement dry land gardening with livestock such as cattle and goats. Cultivation in arid land is risky. Even if rainfall and harvest are adequate in most years, there is a chance that in any given year, not enough rainfall will fall. Therefore, people who cultivate in dry regions have developed various gardening strategies and techniques to cope with the possibility of drought. In most parts of the American Southwest, annual rainfall Rainfall averages only about 10 inches concentrated in the spring and late summer. Over centuries, Western Pueblo peoples such as the Zuni, Hopi, and Acoma learned to cope with the risk of drought by planting some of their crops in those areas most likely to retain soil moisture as around seeps and springs. Yet in some areas, in some years, the unpredictable rains are so torrential that runoff washes away the crops. To cope with such natural ha hazards, Pueblo diversi diversify both the place and the time of their planting. They plant seeds of corn, squash, beans, and other crops in several locations so that no matter what the weather, some fields usually produce a harvest, staggering the time of planting likewise lowers the risk of cultivation. Thus, by mixing up and when they plant, Pueblo peoples reduce the risk of cultivation in an arid, highly seasonal environment, and in favorable years, they stored corn in ceramic plots pl placed inside adobe and wood houses. Cultural Consequences of, of Horticultural The productivity yield for a given amount of land of various horticultural methods is much greater than that of foragers. Some people think 
horticulture is rudimentary agriculture because the physical tools are so simple. However, horticultural peoples developed sophisticated knowledge of what, when, and where to plant to handle environmental problems. Their tools may be simple, but their knowledge is not at all rudimentary. In fact, agricultural scientists study ind indigenous horticultural systems to learn how some traditional peoples have farmed their land sustainability for hundreds of years. At a general level, how do the cultures of horticulturalists differ from those of foragers? Subsequent chapters, this chapters address this question more <clears throat> more thoroughly. For now, we note that note only two of the most important ways in which horticultural adaptation at, shapes the way of life of people who live by it. First. Most horticulturalists live in larger and more permanent settlements rather than bands or camps of 20 to 50. Most horticulturalists aggregate the, into hamlets or villages, sometimes with hundreds of residents. Also, rather than moving for every few weeks, people become more sedentary, remaining in the same location for years, decades, or sometimes even longer. Settlements are more permanent because effective adaptation does not require people to move frequently and families who have cleared and planted plots want to stay around at least long enough to recoup their labor investment. Second resource allocation differs for most hunter-gatherers. Particular individuals, families, and other groups are more attached to specific fairly bounded places where they, are, where they or their ancestors established a claim. When a family invests its labor in clearing, planting, and improving plots or fields, over time that investment establishes the family claim, family's claim to the land. Families pass those claims rights on to their children, most of whom transmit their rights, the rights to their own children. Over several generations, families and or family lines become become the recognized owners of particular plots of land. In turn, these two factors have other effects. For example, if people remain in one place for years or decades, it is easier to store possessions which raise the potential for wealth accumulation. More definite land rights raise the possibility that some families will inherit or others otherwise acquire more productive resources than others. Because the land itself becomes, a value, becomes valuable within a settlement rights, to parcel may be disrupted, or I'm sorry, disputed, and people who cultivate the land are lo not likely to, to be willing to abandon their ancestral lands without some kind of argument or conflict between, between settlements. Potentially some larger, stronger hamlet or a village will want to take over the lands <clears throat> of smaller militarily weaker groups, intergroup violent conflict is more likely among horticulturalists than for foragers. Intensive agriculture. Let me go ahead and zoom in on the vocabulary word. The map. Intensive agriculture. In the farming system, anthropologists call intensive agriculture. Farmers keep their fields under cultivation far longer than horticulturalists. Indeed, some intensive agriculturalists have maintained their lands under almost continuous cultivation. The same fields are farmed year after year with only brief fallow periods. This is what is meant by using land more intensively. To produce higher yields, farmers work the land and usually themselves harder. This motivates them to develop new technologies to ease their workloads and to keep farm productive for a long time. Figure 7.3 shows a major regions where intensive agriculturalists lived at the time of the first contact with Europeans. With shifting cultivation, people rely mainly on natural processes to restore land productivity, which 
works but takes a long time. Intensification is possible only if people use their own labor and knowledge to maintain the yields of their land for longer periods. In various regions, people fertilize generally with dung and or of livestock, rotate crops, weed carefully, turn over the soil prior to planting, add compost organic matter to the soil, and irrigate the crops. For some of these tasks, a new tool, the plow, and a new source of energy, the muscle power of draft animals, are useful. Using plows pulled by horses, mules, oxen, water buffalo, or other draft animals, a farmer can qu more quickly prepare the soil. In addition to traction for the plow, livestock provide many other useful products, meat, milk, and other dairy products, manure, hides, and transportation. After harvest, the livestock may be turned to loose be turned loose to graze on the residue of crops, fertilizing fields with their dung. For all these reasons, intensive agriculture is substantially more productive per land, per area of land than horticulture. An acre of land produces greater yields, hence it is capable of supporting far more people, five to ten, and even twenty times the numbers of most horticultural peoples supporting more people in most certainly the main advantage of intensive agriculture over horticulture. Variations of intensive agriculture. In the old world, especially in parts of Asia and Europe, intensive agriculturalists plowed the land by harnessing oxen, horses, or other draft animals to plows. This allowed them to farm far more land than if they used only human labor. Another method of increasing yields is to augment the water supply by artificial means. Farmers around the world use many irrigation methods. Some construct low dams along steams, streams and rivers to conserve runoff and dig ditches to transport water to the fields. In many Asian river valleys, ditches transport water and fertile silt to fields during the annual monsoons. When rivers overturn, overrun their banks in many mountainous regions of Southwest, Southeast Asia and China, the level of water and in hillside rice fields is controlled with an elaborate system of terraces. Rice is produced through a highly coordinated system to supply water in these wet rice regions. Along China's northeastern plain, the emperor controlled floods along the Yellow River by organizing citizens to construct and maintain levees. Visitors to the region may be surprised to find the river level is higher than the surrounding plain. Thanks to the labor of millions of Chinese peasants over many centuries, although indigenous natives, Native Americans, had no animals suitable for plow agriculture, they developed their way, other ways of improving yields and keeping land under prolonged cultivation. Native Americans in places such as the Valley of Mexico, land of the Aztecs and the Andes, homeland of the Inca, had large cities and high population densities. So their farming classes had to produce a lot of food. In the Valley of Mexico, people transformed swamps and margins of lakes into productive fields called chin chinampas by constructing raised fields in which they planted crops like tomatoes, squash, and corn. By continually growing or continually adding new organic materials from the lake bottoms, they kept gardens under cultivation for several years. In the Andes, the, civil, the citizens of the Inca Empire constructed step terraces to reduce erosion, growing an incredibly, incredible variety of potatoes and other crops during the summer. Andean peoples also developed a variety of methods for coping with frost in, the mount, in their mountainous homelands. In some, compared with holder culturalists, intensive agriculturalists produced more food per unit of land. Its high productivity is due to factors such as short or no fallow periods, preparing the land more thoroughly prior to planting, removing weeds, adding manure and other organic matter, 
to preserve fertility and manipulating the supply of water, these and other inputs give people greater control over conditions in their fields, leading to higher yields per unit of land, assuming all goes well in nature. Cultural consequences of intensive agriculture. I'm so sorry. Here's the vocabulary word. Intensive farming eventually had dramatic cultural consequences in many regions, most of which resulted from the relatively high productivity of agricultural lands. A farm family using intensive methods can usually feed more, many more people than just its own members. Intensive farmers can produce a surplus over and above their own subsistence food requirements. This surplus can be used to feed other people, families, and groups who no longer need to produce their own food. What happens to the surplus? Many things depending on circumstances. Farmers can trade excess food for other useful products like pottery, tools, wood, and clothing if the community has money. See chapter 8. Families may produce excess food to sell and use the money to buy other food goods. If the village or other settlement has a strong political leader, such as a chief, he can collect the surplus as tribute from his subjects and use the food to pay laborers who work on public projects such as trails, temples, and irrigation facilities. If the community is part of a larger, more encompassing political system with a ruler and a governmental bureaucracy, then the government may collect part of the surplus as tax. Political officials then use the tax for public purposes, example, the support of the armies, the judiciary, and the religious hierarchy, and or to further its own political interests. These possibilities illustrate a central fact about the pre-industrial farmers who relied on intensive agriculture. Most were not politically independent and economically self-sufficient communities, but were incorporated into some kind of lo larger system organized at a higher level. Their villages and or towns were part of a more inclusive political system that dominated or ruled them in some way. The surplus they produced was traded, sold, or taxed, or all three, to support people who did not themselves do for farm work. People such as rulers, aristocrats, bureaucrats, priests, warriors, merchants, and craft specialists, intensive agriculture, then in pre-industrial industrial times, was strongly associated with large-scale political and economic organization. Local-level farmers in villages produced food and other products for people who lived elsewhere, and they in turn received things, products, services from the larger system. The association of the intensive agriculture with large-scale political organization is ancient, going back to more than 5,000 years in parts of the Old World and more than 3,000 years in two regions of the New World. Within a few centuries or millennia after the development of intensive agriculture, civilization emerged in these regions. These civilizations were socially and politically complex societies, including among other things, the first cities. Civilizations have, for, have a form of government known as the state, discussed in chapter 12, which contrasted markedly with its egalitarian groups of foragers. States are large-scale political units that include a ruler, a governing bureaucracy, class distinctions between the elite and common plate people, see chapter 13, and methods of extracting labor and surplus products from those responsible for farming the land. In ancient times, intensive farmers were incorporated into the four major civilizations of the old world. The valley of the the valley formed by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers of Mesopotamia, the Nile Valley of Egypt of of Egypt, the Indus River Valley of Pakistan, and the vast empire of China. In the, new, in the New World, two agricultural peoples were part of a large-scale political unit such as the Maya, the Toltec, and Aztec of Mesopotamia, Mesoamerica, and the Inca of the Andean coast and highlands. 
Intensive farmers supported other classes and occupations in these early civilizations. They produced the food and paid tribute or taxes to support the rulers, priests, armies, and officials who staffed the government, armies who protected the city, priests who organized the worship, sorry, organized the worship of gods, craftspeople who specialized in pottery, masonry, carpentry, weaving, and other tasks, merchants who brought and sold products. So far, as we know, intensive agriculture is virtually a prerequisite for civilization. No civilization ever developed out of a foraging or horticultural adaptation. However, excuse me, there was a positive feedback between intensification of agriculture and civilization. As the people in civilizations grew in numbers and as the civilization state became more complex, more food was needed, which led farmers to work the fields even harder, resulting in further intensification of agriculture. By about 2,000 years ago, other states developed in old world places like Korea and Japan, both influenced by China, southern India, much of Southeast Asia, parts of Africa, and most of Europe. In later centuries, the entire world was dramatically affected by states which tended to expand to incorporate more people and resources to supply necessities for ordinary citizens and luxury goods for elite classes. Intensive farming methods survive even in the 21st century, especially in the developing regions of Southern Asia and Southeast Asia, Latin America and Africa. Economically, farming communities often fit into their nations as peasants, a term anthropologists apply to rural people who live by <clears throat> a combination of subsistence, agriculture, and market sale. Peasants are integrated into a larger society, both politically. They are subject to laws and governments imposed by their nations, and economically they exchange products of their own labor for goods produced elsewhere. In many developing countries, peasants are a numerical majority of the population and produce much of the food consumed by town and city dwellers. Peasants produce goods goods that are sold for money, traded or bartered, paid to a landlord as rent, and rendered to a central government as taxes. So far as we know, there were no peasants until the emergence of the ancient civilization, so one byproduct of civilization was the development of peasant classes. The farm work of prehistoric and historic peasants fed the craft workers, the merchants, the state-sponsored priests, the political elite, the warriors, and the builders of palaces and temples. Peasants paid tribute or tax in food, crafts, labor, and or money. And these resources provided for the maintenance of the society as a whole, as well as the elite classes. The peasantry of feudal Europe, for example, ate out a meager living, paying a substantial portion of their annual harvest to their lords or working many days a year on their lords' estates. Civilization is usually viewed as a good thing, leading to progress as it spread to other world regions. True, the high productivity of intensive agriculture allowed the specialized division of labor that led to writing, metallurgy, monumental architecture, cities and the great religious and arti artistic traditions we associate with civilizations but what about the peasants who produced the food that made such progress possible for them writing meant that more accurate records could be kept off their taxes or the number of days they worked for overlords Iron and other metals meant that peasants had better farming tools, yet for the most part, they were not allowed to use them to ease their own work, but instead only to produce more surplus for others to appropriate. Metal also meant that weapons became more deadly and armies more dangerous, allowing one state to make war against other states more effectively. Most peasant families continued to live in even while 
engineers design, des designed great palaces, religious structures, and walled cities and towns that were built using peasant tax labor. Throughout history, most peasants uh, the world over were denied the benefits offered by technological process progress, although the food they produced made much of this progress possible. In his 2007 a book to a book, A Farewell to Alms, economic historian Gregory Clark argues that agricultural agriculture and civilization did not improve human life for the majority of people at all. Not until well after the Industrial Revolution of the late 1700s did the quality of life for most ordinary people improve as measured by nutrition, longevity, health status, and consumption levels. The situation is more diverse than Clark implies, but for decades, anthropologists have questioned the notion that human life has steadily improved since the discovery of agriculture the increased food supply of agriculture could have improved life for ordinary people, and sometimes it did. But often the secondary effects of agriculture on societies and pol polities, it's probably politics, made the major majority of people worse off. Surpluses benefited mainly elite classes much more than those who actually produced the food. Perhaps there was a broader lesson. In most cases, people who own resources and make important decisions for others tend to gain most when something is said to improve. Pastoralism. Most farmers keep domesticated animals. Southeast Asian and Pacific horticulturalist raise many pigs and chickens. Intensive agriculturalists raise livestock uh, like horses, mules, oxen, water buffalo, and cattle. Livestock pull their plows, fertilize their fields, provide leather and wool, and yield meat and dairy products, milk, cheese, yogurt, and other nutritious foods. Livestock are more than supplementary to farming because of the meat at eggs, milk, hides, wool, transportation, fertilizer, and horsepower they provide, domestic animals are usually critical to the nutritional and economic welfare of cultivators. The income earned by selling livestock of, or their products is often the main source of cash for many peasants and other farmers in developing countries. However, cultivators do not depend on their livestock to the same extent or in the same way as pastoralist or herders, <clears throat> excuse me, herders. Herders acquire much of their, I'm, I'm going to check and see. You'll want to get that one. Okay. Herders acquire much of their food by raising, caring for, and subsist, subsist, subsisting on the products of domesticated animals. With few exceptions, these livestock are gregarious herd animals. Cattle, camels, sheep, goats, reindeer, horses, llamas, alpacas, and yaks are the common animals kept by herders in various parts of the world. Here is the map. And here is the vocabulary word. <coughs> this section doesn't, goes all the way to the next page, so that's why I paused. Agriculture and keeping livestock often coexist among the pe same people. However, when identifying a people as pastoral, we mean more than that they keep livestock. When farmers raise livestock, they generally grow crops, especially for their animals or maintain followed fields on which their animals graze. In contrast, among pastoral people, livestock rely on grassy pasture lands that grow naturally in their territories. The key phrase is grow naturally. The needs of their animals for naturally occurring food and water greatly influence the seasonal rhythms of their lives. 
Most often the best natural grasslands are seasonally available either because of altitude, altitude, generally more grasslands exist in the mountains during summers or because the herds themselves deplete the grasses by feeding on them. So most pastoralists migrate two or more times a year. This seasonal mobility called nomadism excuse me, is the defining feature of the pastoral way of life. Contrary to what some people think, pastoralists do not wander aimlessly, but migrate in organized seasonal and spatial patterns. Most herders take their li livestock to highland areas or mountain pastures to graze during the hottest season of the year. Seasonal movements up and down slope according to the productivity of the pasture lands is called transhumans. For the most part, herders live only certain kinds of environments. Figure 7.5 shows the primary areas where pastoralists live prior to European expansion. Pastoralists live mainly in deserts, grasslands, savannas, mountains, and Arctic tundra. Although diverse, these environments do share a common feature. Cultivation is, is impossible, extremely difficult, or highly risky because of inadequate of, or greatly yearly fluctuations in rainfall, as in deserts or savannas, or very short growing seasons, as in mountains and tundra. As always, there are exceptions to our generalizations, but most pastoralists live in regions not well suited to cultivation. In such arid or cold environments, keeping livestock offers several advantages. First, most vegetation of grasslands or and arid savannas, grasses and shrubs and tundra, lichens, willows, and sedges is not edible for humans. Livestock such as cattle, sheep, goats, and reindeer can digest this vegetation and transform it into milk, blood, fat, and muscle all of which are drunk or eaten by various pastoral peoples. The Samai people, formerly called the Lops of Northern Europe, keep reindeer they, that eat uh, the sparse tundra vegetation and transform it into flesh and milk that is eaten by their owners. The Turkanya of Kenya and many other Eastern East African people, peoples who live in arid lands, mountain, enormous herds of cattle drinking their milk and blood almost daily and eat, eating their flesh only on special occasions. After all, a, a living cow produces products continuously so often it is worth more alive than dead. As these examples illustrate, in some regions, livestock allows people to exploit indirectly certain wild plant resources not directly available to them. In brief, livestock converts inedible plants and into edible products. A related advantage of herding is subs substance risk reduction in areas of low and unreliable rainfall. In some years, crop yields are inadequate because of drought. In Tibet, Peru, and other high-altitude regions, crops may fail because of low temperatures or short growing seasons. Livestock provides insurance against fluctu fluctuations in the food supply from the unpredictable droughts and cold periods. The, Karaman the Karamajong of Uganda traditionally lived by a combination of horticultural and cattle herding. In the central wetter parts of their lands, Karamong women tended gardens of sorghum and African grain and a few other crops. Crop yields fluctuated unpredictably with rainfall. Boys and young men took the family's cattle and to pasture lands away from where the women lived and worked. While living in these small mobile cow camps, the men lived largely by drinking the milk and blood of their herds. Supplemented by the sorghum beer that the women sometimes brought when they visited. Not only did cattle add animal products to the Karamahong diet, but they also provided insurance against low sorghum yields. In brief, livestock helps 
people cope with risky environments. A third advantage of livestock is their mobility. Not only do animals store meat in the hoof, but they also can be traded or sold to neighboring peoples. Herds can be moved to areas where the pasture is most lush or where the water supply is abundant. People can move their herds and themselves away from neighbors who have grown true aggressive. In some regions, the, like Africa, Sahara, or Central Asia's ancient Silk Road, caravans of camels moved products produced in one place across hundreds of miles of relatively barren land where they were traded or sold 2,000 years ago. The elite of the Roman Empire enjoyed the translucent, flimsy garments made from the Chinese silk that had been transported across Asia. The Romans had no idea that the fine fibers came from the larvae stage of the silk moth. All along the cold, arid route were trading traditions trading stations and towns where traders were serviced and where products were sold to be transported and sold again at the next station or town. Aridity temperature, short growing seasons, and other ecological and climate climatic factors go a long way toward ex explaining why pastoralists live where and how they do. However, the natural environment does not totally explain the geographic distribution of pastoral peoples. Some herders live in areas where the environment can support crops. Although they s certainly know how to cultivate the soil, they choose not to grow crops. Many decades ago, British anthropologists defined a culture area known as the East African Cattle Complex. In this complex widespread in East African savannas, cattle are more than ordinary source of food. The East African man loves his cattle like some North Americans love their SUVs and pickups. Cattle represent wealth and manliness. They are the source of prestige and influence in tribal affairs, and they are bride wealth for wives. When sacrificed ritually, cattle are religious symbols and are the source of blessings from the ancestors to, and gods. The cattle herding Maasai of Kenya and Tanzania are a famous example of the East African cattle complex. In some parts of Maasai, territory cultivation is possible. In fact, most Ma Maasai neighbors combine cattle herding with cultivation of sorghum and other crops. However, the proud Maasai look down on cultivation because their cattle represent wealth and are the main symbol of their cultural identity relative to their neighbors. Maasai, therefore, live largely off the products of their cattle, blood, milk, meat, curds, and trade with their neighbors for cultivated foods. The reasons so many Maasai continue their pastoral way of life are therefore cultural as well as ecological. Their pastoral way of life helps define their cultural identity relative to neighboring peoples. The main benefit of pastoralism is that it allows large numbers of people to live well in regions unsuitable or marginal for farming. It therefore is informative to compare how most indigenous herders raise and feed their livestock with how livestock are raised and fattened in nations with industrialized food systems. Traditional pastoralists might teach us that li livestock are most efficiently used as converters of edible plants into edible meat and other animal products. If you feed foods that people can eat to livestock, you lose most of the energy, vitamins, and protein to the to the bodily functions of the animal. Yet consider livestock use in North America and other nations where agricultural production is mechanized. In such nations, government policies provide subsidies to certain farmers, high yields produce an excessive of low priced agricultural commodities, and most citizens have little knowledge of livestock. What farm animal has life stages called guilt or and shot 
are about how the, their food is produced. In North America, most soybeans and corn are grown as fodder for cattle, pigs, and fowl. When you eat a pound of flesh indirectly, you consume several pounds of corn and soy. You also consume and pay for the energy used to grow and pr process the corn and soy into animal fodder. You support the industries that produce the fertilizers, herbicides, and insecticides used to produce the crops that make grocery brought, bought meats so tender and juicy. That is so fatty. Nature and culture in pre-industrial times. So far, we have synthesized an enormous amount of information, although we have not covered many complications and exceptions. Recognizing these, we emphasize on one on emphasize one major point. The ways a people harness the resources and cope with the problems of living in a particular environment are important influences on many dimensions of the group's culture. See the concept review for a summary of these influences. Just how important these influences are, of course, is debatable. As the scientific humanistic theoretical approaches illustrate, see chapter five, Nonetheless, a few anthropologists question the following gener generalizations about the relationship between the main forms of human interaction with nature and cultural systems. In most environments, foraging is most efficient when people live in small, seasonably mobile groups of main that maintain flexible rights to the natural resources of large territories, horticultural people, Settle in hamlets or villages in which land and other pro productive resources are owned by families or other kinship or residential groups. Intensification. Intensive agriculture re resulted in the development of towns and cities occupied by elites and specialists and surrounded by rural peasant communities that contribute labor, tribute and or tax to support the government and public projects. Pastoral peoples are seasonally nomadic with grazing rights to pasture lands vested in families or other kin groups or in the tribe as a whole. In future chapters, we, as we discover, or as we cover various as aspects of culture, we sometimes discuss the ways in which human environment interaction, interactions affect family life, gender relationships, political organization, and other dimensions of cultural systems. Here is the concept review. I'll kind of, hopefully you can get all that. I'll try and do that if you want to make notes. There is four parts to this. Industrialism. Thus so far, Thus far, we have focused on pre-industrial peoples before the domestication of animals and the development of plow farming in parts of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Humans use their own muscle power and hand tools to interact their, with their environments. Once intensive agriculture developed in some regions, farmers took advantage of the, the muscle power of their cattle, oxen, horse oxen, horses, and other livestock. In addition to using their own energy to do agricultural work, humans worked their livestock to acquire additional energy. Notice that both these energy sources were living organisms. Another source of energy was dead trees, wood, which provided fuel for warmth and cooking, but those trees had died recently. Industrialism is the most recent and not necessarily the final major way in which humans interact with nature. Industrialism shelters the world more affluent persons from the environment and provides them with their means of survival without them having to engage nature directly. Except under tight, tightly controlled conditions like sea cruises, hunting trips, and fishing vacations, heating and air conditioning keeps us keep us warm or cool indoors, and we no longer need to butcher our own meat or gather firewood for cooking. 
machines and the energy needed to power them substitute for human labor, allowing people who 200 years ago would have been producing food, wood, pottery, metals, and other material things to find other jobs in factories and services. In fact, one of the hallmarks of industrialization is that few people work in activities that extract natural resources like farming, fishing, lumbering, and mining. This is a new condition in human history. Energy and society. Industrialization began in Great Britain in the late 1700s and in the next several decades spread to the rest of Europe and North America. At first, British textile mills and later those in New England were powered by falling water. Around 1800, efficient ways were found to burn coal to produce compressed steam, which powered looms that could turn out textiles of cotton and wool in massive quantities. Later, people figured out ways to harness the energy stored in oil and natural gas. There is a reason that coal, oil, and natural gas are called fossil fuels. Each of these energy sources derives ultimately from long decayed plant and animals. While living, these organisms took in carbon, con concentrated it in their bodies, where most of it still exists in the form of mineral deposits or natural gas released by decay. Once combusted, coal, oil, and natural gas release enormous quantities of energy. Physicists say, often say that energy is the capacity to do work. With vast quantities of energy, vast quantities of work can be done. Thanks to machinery and fossil fuels, more than to human work, therefore vast quantities often of products can be manufactured electrically generated from coal or oil fire powered plants falling water hydroelectric and most recently nuclear resources provides power for private industries and private homes in the long time frame of human prehistory and history these are all very recent developments no matter how normal they seem to people alive today way back in the 1940s the non-evolutionist Leslie White, see chapter five, theorized that energy capture is the most important factor in powering cultural change. Excuse me. Some numbers White found White would find important are worth mentioning. Mentioning, kilowatt hours are one of the most. Are, I'm sorry, kilowatt hours are one measure of power defined as the rate at which energy is converted to work. Every week, the muscle of a man who has is fairly fit can generate about three kilowatts of power. A gallon of gasoline contains about 12.3 kilowatts <clears throat> hours of power, which is equivalent to about four weeks of human muscle power. If you spend $3,000 or I'm sorry, $3 on a gallon of gas, that $3 buys about four weeks of equivalent human power. In terms of ability to get work done without having to do it with our own muscle power, think of energy from fossil fuels as comparable to the human power that slaves pr provided to their masters one slave provided power, work, two slaves provided twice as much power, and so on. As Thomas Love points out, metaphorically, fossil fuels are our energy slaves. The energy output of $3 worth of gasoline is equivalent to having one slave working for us for four weeks. Except during periodic energy crisis. Citizens of industrialized nation states take the energy derived from fossil fuels for granted, seldom thinking about what happens when they turn on the lights, light switches, car engines, air conditioners, and stove. When the world marketplace price of crude oil rises over $100 per barrel, we become more aware of the monetary costs of energy 
and are sure they are price gouging us. Energy to move around as we wish and to heat and cool our living space is so important that we usually give up something else if its price increases. But fossil fuels are cheap, are very cheap. If you drink bottled water, you pay more per gallon to slake your thirst than you do to power your car. When the price of gasoline skyrockets to $3 a gall per gallon, giving up bottled water will help you weather the next energy crisis. Consequences of industrialism. Acquiring energy from fossil fuels was the key development of the Industrial Revolution. It was more than a revolution in how products were made as just one component of the dramatic consequences for human life. Consider what happened to food production and distribution. As factors developed over time and more people migrated to cities to work for wages, urban factory workers and their families needed food and industrial products had to be moved around. So roads and transportation networks became more extensive. Markets expanded to supply food to city people and factory products like clothing and tools to farmers. Some farmers out in the countryside continued to grow their own food, but eventually most farmers specializing in selling food to others, the more farmers can produce, the more they can sell. So farmers were motivated to invest in technology that made their land more productive. By the early 20th century, New companies specialized in supplying the demands of farmers for equipment, e.g. tractors, chemicals, fertilizers, insecticides, water, pumps, and similar products. By the mid-20th century, factory farming was common in the developed world. Around 1950, an American factory farmer could produce enough food to supply food for 20 to 30 non-farmers. 2015, that production was closer to 50 non-farmers. Changes in food production and distribution are only one consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Most people take their lifestyle for granted. Think about a few other implications of industrialism <clears throat> for your life. Most readers would be hungry without supermarkets or some other kind of retail outlets that used to be called grocery stores. Even if you knew how to hunt, fish, and garden, you probably don't have access to enough land to support yourself, unless you're a wealthy, in which case you might have, or be able to get the land but don't want to support yourself in that way. Most likely, your individual workday is, for some day, will be tightly scheduled. Then, same applies to your week. But at least there's a the weekend. Perhaps you think you are burning up when you go outside into 95 degree heat and freezing if you your living space goes down to 55 degrees. If you are not already a homeowner, someday you probably hope to become one. You will feel lucky to have your own place and probably do not know that most people in humanity's past have, have had a place to live without having to buy it at all. You are far more likely to have one or two children than six or seven. Having only a child or two won't hurt you much because you don't need help, need children to help around the farm or to support you when you get old besides kids cost a lot all that daycare new outfits sport fees college education and the rest you hope social security and other forms of assistance will still be there when you retire chances are you will live long enough long after your retirement at least if you have enough discipline to control your diet and exercise more often if none of these seem like the result of the, a revolution, contrast how we live with the ethnographic examples of foragers, farmers, and pastoralists described earlier in this chapter. Remember that industrialism has only been around for about two and a half centuries. Industrial technology opened up all kinds of possibilities for humanity. 
It has improved the material living standards of two to three billion people in the last two or so centuries. Like other ways of extracting nature's resources, industrialism has social and cultural consequences. And like the others, it is not free of cost. Transportation provides an example of these possibilities and costs. By the mid 1800s, steam engines powered by locomotives that made train transportation both rapid and cheap one cost of this progress is was that most wagon makers had to find new ways of making a living. Trains greatly facilitated the settlement of the American West. Boxcars moved Western products east and vice versa, helping integrate the American economy and eventually forming a single market where the beef from cattle grazed in Colorado sold at about the same price in Oregon and North Carolina. Later, when a way was found to manufacture internal combustion engines powered by gasoline automobiles, where even automobiles were invented, after Henry Ford introduced the assembly line production of automobiles in the early decades of the 20th century, increased efficiency production brought the car the cost of autos down so much that ordinary families could afford one in the united states in the in the 1950s the federal government responded by constructing tens of thousands of miles of new roads including the interstate highway system by using income tax revenues to do so the fed subsidized the auto industry and car owners this iconic this is ironic given the present widespread outcry over proposed federal and state subsidies for public transportation. Passenger travel and freight transport by rail declined as a consequence, even though trains are far more efficient in energy terms than cars and trucks. By the late 1900s, middle class families could afford two or three or more ve motor vehicles, including the minivans that facilitated hauling kids and purchases. In the last half of the 20th century, two new methods of freight transportation grew rapidly. Trucks and container ships, both modes and of transpor transporting freights, had worldwide consequences and caused rapid changes in how millions of people live their everyday lives. Although most of these consequences were unknown or not thought about, the long haul trucking industry moves products rapidly and cheaply from factories and fields to retail stores and supermarkets. In January, residents of Ontario and North Dakota can enjoy produce grown on irrigated mega farms in Southern California's Imperial Valley and tomato fields in Northwestern Mexico. Should global energy prices increase significantly, increased costs for growing and transport transporting the veggies will rise and Northerners will pay more for Southern foods. The same will occur should the federal government eliminate the huge subsidies. It now pays for the irrigation water necessary to transform California's Imperial Valley from semi-desert to agricultural paradise. The globalization of industrialism. Obviously, the growth and spread of industrial social society have global impacts. It encouraged colonialism as richer nations sought na natural resources to supply their factories to seek control over natural resources in other continents. See chapter four. Although the colonial centuries have passed today, most nations participate in the global industrial system in which richer nations establish factories offshore. Many forces <clears throat> encourage the globalization of factory production. One that most people overlooked is the cost of ocean transportation. By lowering cost of transporting freight out to overseas destination, giant container ships helped integrate the global economy. The places and people that produce manufactured commodities are different places and people than where the company is registered and where most of the stock of its stockholder resides. Of course, profits are the reason so many manufacturing jobs have moved offshore. It is 
cost effective for American companies to ship computer components to China where Chinese workers assemble them into a Mac or a PC, then send them back to the United States. But computer makers still make more profits and consumers enjoy lower cost than if computers were assembled by American or Canadian workers. Should global energy price rises enough, then higher shipping costs will curtail or slow the globalization of production. The consequence of such a slowdown would be global and serious. Most people explain the relocation of assembly and other production facilities to newly industrialized countries in Asia and other continents, mainly by lower labor costs. Labor is inexpensive in countries like China and India for several reasons. They have millions of people migrating to cities looking for factory jobs, so the labor is plentiful. Chinese factories, though, began complaining about labor shortages in 2012. For many reasons, most unskilled labor is not organized by unions. One reason that governments and local managers want to keep wages, wages low so their workforce is competitive in the global labor market. Another is that there is there are plenty of unskilled laborers to accept work that others refuse because of its low wages. Also, India and China are often said to be overpopulated, meaning they allegedly have too many people to be supported by their nation's resource and economic base. Globalization of factory production provides their people with more resources, mainly with jobs which have become the resources, no longer natural ones, that most people in industrialized nations need for survival and well-being. Conversely, factory globalization has taken away resources, job wages, from many factory workers in North America, Japan, and Europe. If factories close or if workers in general have not paid had to pay raises in a decade or two those workers have done nothing to decrease the resources at the same time globalization has indirectly increased resources available to consumers in the wealthier nations whose corporations have exported jobs overseas if you pay lower prices for electronics, clothing, shoes, and a host of other goods because they are produced in countries with low wages, your money will buy more commodities. You now have more resources, although you have done nothing more, done nothing to create them, but have simply benefited from global market forces. Globalization and envi the environment. Low labor costs alone do not account for the explosive growth of what some call the global factory. Since the 1980s, other costs of offshore pr production for corporations are also are low. Because factory health and safety and environmental regulations are more lax than in corporations for home countries, when European, Japanese, North American, and Australian governments passed far-reaching environmental regulations in the 1970s, they increased the production costs of their industries. But to the extent that governments applied the regulations evenly and fairly, no particular company in an industry received a competitive advantage. Companies adjusted by lowering expenses in other areas and increasing what they charged consumers, they adapted to the new regulatory environment. Most scientists and many ordinary citizens recognize the heavy environmental cost of industrialization. Natural resources are harvested from all over the world to supply raw materials for factories. Extracting resources leads to depletions, landscape destruction, soil erosion, and other deteriorations of environmental quality as a byproduct of burning fossil fuels like coal and oil. Factories pollute the air, making government regulation mandatory for environmental and health reasons. Coal mines dig out earth and rock to uncover se seams of coal without regulations to curtail them. Factories would release toxic chemicals that pollute waterways. Modern agriculture 
usually is more factory-like than farm-like. Relying on machinery for most operations, runoff from agricultural chemicals and modern livestock, feedlots pollutes rivers and streams, government regulation of mines, Indust industries, farms, auto emissions, and the like of, have significantly reduced many environmental impacts in South Korea, Japan, Australia, North America, and Europe. If it were not for these regulations and their enforcement of the environmental consequences of industrializ industrialism would certainly be far worse than they are. Anyone who lived in Los Angeles Basin in the 1960s and 1970s has experienced these consequences. Anyone living today in Beijing, Rio de Janeiro, or in Mumbai is experiencing them now. Why don't farms and businesses just act environmentally responsible ways? A few do, of course. However, in a market economy, if an environmentally responsible company voluntarily decides to clean up its waste and reduce its harmful emissions, then that company will suffer in the competitive marketplace because its production costs will rise. That would be economically foolish and competitive markets do not reward this kind of foolishness. Ever since factory production boomed in countries like Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the BRIC countries, their citizens experience the negative environmental effects of factory production. Consider the People's Republic of China, PRC, with several hundred million rural peasants and relatively low factory wages, rates, wage rates, China is still not a rich country. China has a huge population of nearly 1.4 billion people, four times that of the United States a government that seems committed to development, a cultural tradition infused with a work ethic and a large pool of workers. In August, 2010, China surpassed China as the world's second largest economy, now trailing only the United States. China's industries have grown so rapidly since the 1980s that it now has serious air and water pollution problems. China uses about half of the world's cement for its new roads and buildings. It imports about half of the world's iron ore, which it manufactures into steel for use in construction and in its products like motor vehicles and ships. Tap water is unsafe to drink in most large Chinese cities. According to the World Bank in 2007, China had 16 of the world's 20 most polluted cities. One day in January 2013, the air pollution index in Beijing was 755, measured on a scale of 0 to 500. In late 2012, 16,000 dead pigs were found floating in the river that supplies water to Shanghai, the PRC's largest city. For 2010, a Ministry of Chinese Government estimated the monetary cost of the environmental damage caused by rapid industrialization at $230 billion, which is 3.5% of China's gross domestic product. China's slow pace of economic growth since 2013 led to the reduced construction of new coal-fired power plants. China is building a massive new wind farms and solar panels, so perhaps in the next few decades, it will no longer be the world's leader in emissions. China and India together have about 2.5 billion people, 40% of the world's total population. When countries that this large pollute other countries notice because some kinds of pollution easily cross national borders, air pollution from China, Chinese factories wafts over to the Koreas and Japan. Sometimes upper Atmosphere winds carry sulfur dioxide from China's coal bur burning clear over to North America's Pacific coast. Countries like India and China are experiencing car booms, which increases global oil prices and it hastens the time when the price of oil will rise enough to really threaten the standard of living of the middle class in many countries. 
The newly industrialization regions also contribute significantly to global warming. Raising world issues such as who should pay most to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to in the interest of future generations, the global challenges and opportunities feature discusses this issue. Media gives a lot of pressure to coastal and island people who will be most directly affected by rising sea levels caused by global warming. However, greenhouse gases alter worldwide per precipitation patterns as well as temperature. Climate scientists cannot predict the severity or location of the most serious impacts. Some regions will experience a more favorable climate for crop production than at present because the length of growing seasons will increase or more rainfall will occur. Some climate models suggest that the tropics and subtropics will experience the most severe agricultural impacts. About 3 billion people will still get about 3 billion people still get most of their food from subsistence farming. For many of them, global warming will reduce their ability to support themselves. The advantage the recently industrialization nations has is have is their ability to deliver products to the global market at the extremity, extremely low cost. If they do not do so, other countries will. Viewed in this context, several and enforced environmental and safety regulations like those adopted by today's rich countries would threaten the constant creation of new jobs and the rise in consumption. China's growth since around 2010 has been slowed by competition from other nations as well as by the fact that it has created newer, more lucrative, high-status jobs because of that growth is itself. Should China impose costly regulations on its factories, <clears throat> prices for its products would rise, and other continual growth of Chinese employment of, and living standards would be further threatened. The Chinese government is legitimately worried about the impacts on social stability and what Chinese leaders call a harmonious society. China has an active environmental movement and its national government is making efforts to clean up its manufacturing. But officials at the local level too often profit by not enforcing regulations. After all, the country is large and the emperor is far away. Unquote. All above is not meant to excuse Brazil, Russia, India, China, and other rapidly industrialization inter industrializing nations for their inability to or unwillingness to pass and enforce environmental regulations. Rather, our point is to propose the environmentalists and self-righteous citizens and the more affluent parts of the world make an more of an effort to grasp the natives' point of view, unquote. To borrow Malinowski's phrasing, see chapter five, how much harm would be done to ordinary citizens of newly industrializing nations if their pro production costs rose substantially? China already is offshoring some of its own production to still poorer nations, who in turn are likely to contribute to global environmental problems. If the Chinese central government should lose control over lose control because of the country cannot provide jobs for 200 or 300 million people, what would be the global consequences? If the richer nations enjoy cleaner air and water partly because they export some of their most polluting ind industries overseas, what are their obligations in regard to environmental protection in the overseas nations? One consequence of globalization is the globalization of consequences. When industrial production globalizes, to do so its negative global environmental impacts, we began this chapter by saying that two of the most important dimensions of human nature interactions are extracting resources and handling environmental problems. Industrialism extracts resources from all over the world. 
and these resources are brought and sold on the world market. The scale of this buying and selling also is new. Global industrialism has created environmental problems that are worldwide that also is new in the last few decades. New international institutions have been created, such as the Organization of American States, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the Organization of African Unity, and the European Union. Nations have signed agreements to that promote free trade, such as the North American Free Trade Agreement. Members of the European Union buy and sell to no one to one another using a new currency, the euro. Countries usually find ways of negotiating and enforcing agreements when it is in their economic interest. Perhaps it's time to do the same for the global environment. I will go ahead and so that you can read this at your leisure. I hope you can see that. So... And here is the summary, so that you can pause and read that at your leisure. And this is the end of chapter seven. Thank you.